Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And welcome to a somewhat ad hoc session um, on the Trojan Horse Affair. Uh, my name is Usama Al-Adhami. Um, I'm an academic at the University of Oxford, and I'm really delighted to have with me uh, Dr. Asim Qureshi uh, of CAGE, uh, a dear friend, but someone with whom, um, you know, I've been discussing the Trojan Horse Affair for quite a few days. Um, we're two academics. We're not from Birmingham. Um, I think we should um, perhaps uh, ask him you can correct me if, because I understand you're from London. Um, yeah. And so um, we're not, you know, we're, I'm hoping to that this will be the first in a number of events uh, in which I hope to invite people um, from Birmingham. There's a chance that um, we'll have a I'll, I'll be having a chat with Tahir Alam tomorrow, uh, just before Jumu'ah. But I hope to invite a number of other people from that from the Alam Rock community in Birmingham. Um, a community that I've not visited, you know, uh, in in a big way. I've just eaten uh, on uh, sort of the main thoroughfare there, which I think a lot of Muslims have done as they've gone through Birmingham, uh, probably on a few occasions. I, I'm not, I can't recall how many. And so um, it really uh, is a pleasure to have uh, you here, um, Asimpe. And uh, we're here actually to discuss uh, an, an important uh, book, which comes up in the course of uh, the a serial uh, sort of podcast series, The Trojan Horse Affair by Brian Reed and Hamza Sayyid. And um, this is, if I recall correctly, I actually re-listened to the episode uh, just today. This is episode five um, of the series. Um, and this is uh, about uh, a couple who emerge, uh, Sue and Stephen Packer. So Susan and Stephen Packer um, were uh, two sort of... Um, teachers at Parkview School, um, Susan eventually resigned and, and uh, Susan Packer eventually resigned and Stephen Packer is now retired. And uh, their story is uh, fascinating, interesting, intriguing, disturbing, um, all of these things. And uh, hopefully we'll spend the next hour and a half before Maghrib, inshallah, um, uh, you know, uh, having a discussion of the book, um, which uh, Asim Qureshi uh, has read thoroughly. I have skim read. Uh, but have gone through the entire text. Um, I have characterized this um, in uh, this particular um, sort of discussion that we've had. I've given the title um, or in the in the post I've described it as Islamophobic literature, um, which is a genre unto itself, I think. Um, but I, I haven't thought about fiction uh, in Islamophobic terms in quite the way that I'm used to the Robert Spencers of the world. And I think that, um, you know, the Trojan Horse Affair podcast has brought um, a, or shone a light on an issue which a lot of us have had a great deal of concern about, but have not had the ability or the platform to be able to express those without potentially being vilified and uh, marginalized in our societies, um, as is the lot for a lot of Muslims in any case. And so um, that's why I think it's important for us and um, Asim Pai will be sh um, sort of joining me in future sessions as well over the next um, days and weeks, I hope. Um, along with other academic colleagues, but also along with um, people from the community, as I've mentioned, um, to discuss, uh, you know, in some respects to narrate um, what's happened from a Muslim perspective, because the narrative has overwhelmingly been controlled by um, people who do not, in my view, have the best interests of the Muslim community at heart, but also to think about what to do next. And that, in a sense, I, I want to um, in a small way, contribute to the sorts of excellent discussions that have been taking place actually on Twitter spaces over the last couple of days. Um, and inshallah, um, I'm sure uh, Asim Pai uh, will have uh, excellent insights to offer. But I I'd like to just give the floor to you um, uh, briefly. And I've, I've kind of introduced myself. I'm an academic. Um, I don't know if you want to um, introduce yourself briefly as well. InshaAllah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, I, I, I sometimes describe myself as an accidental academic. Um, it's not really something that I, I very much started my career out even thinking that I would ever get involved in. Um, writing has always been a byproduct of um, kind of the work representing people whose lives have been turned upside down by, um, you know, this global war on terror. And so... You know, for me, it, you know, it's really interesting us having this conversation about this novel because, you know, I mean, the, the novel's 
you know, you know, the weasel about Bakwas. Um, but I, you know, I've, you know, this, it's, it's really not a great piece of literature by any stretch of the imagination. I think anybody who's been reading the excerpts that I've been sharing online can very much see that it's, it's, it's quite, uh, it's quite poor in terms of, of, of its writing. But the, the reason why I felt it was important to, um, to look at this novel is because in the podcast itself, you know, Stephen Packer says that that writing this novel was his telling uh, of the story of what happened to them at the school. Right. So right. he he himself is tying the story to what happened, and therefore there is a there is a connection that he himself is willing to admit to between right. the novel and 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 real life. And I think, right. you know, for me it became important to see how how he understood. Uh, what was going on in the school, you know, and placing it next to what we know about what happens in real life. Right. But really, the main reason why I feel that Stephen Packer is extremely important, Stephen Sue Packer, uh, to to think about is because, you know, ultimately it's personal. Friends of mine uh, lost their jobs because they give, you know, Stephen Packer in particular gave evidence in in the cases against my friends. Um, and so, yes. I, you know, I think even if they weren't my friends, I'd like to think that I would have a very, very similar position like I do for people I don't know right. uh, who are clients of mine. But right. it does feel personal as well in some ways to me that, you know, people that I knew had testimony given about them, their their views and their thinking were, were pathologized uh, by this man. Um, and, and, he his used his, and his wife indeed. And his wife indeed, right. That's yes. right. Um, uh you know, in order to 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 cause harm, and that that harm, yes, had an individual impact in the case of these men, but it went further than that. And I think you know the the relationship they have with the Humanist Association um, is so important as well, because you know this isn't some kind of like you know benevolent organization that exists you know akin to like major human rights organizations, whatever else. It is. It's very uh, <laughs> you know to to coin a word that they like to use themselves, dogmatic in its approach to uh, its its own um, particular form of, of, of secularism. And with that comes this kind of idea of um, reducing the space for Islam in the, in the public space. And somehow seeing anything about Islam in the public space as being a form of entryism, as being a form of um, of trying to somehow take take over the the fundamental identity of of, of British life, which is which is a contested right. ground right. anyway. Right. Um, and so, you know, while we may joke a little bit about the content of the book as <laughs> over the course of this conversation, because I think there is a the, 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 there is a lot that's humorous about it um, in a very very dark way. Ultimately, we're talking about it because um, because of the real world impact that these right. people had on the lives of others. And that's the significance. I think the uh, the tragicomic sensibility actually has its role in these sorts of circumstances. And this is something we've had a conversation about in the past when I was discussing your book, A Virtue of Disobedience. And I, at one point, was laughing at the absurdity of a situation. And you said you laugh, but in a sense, that's a coping mechanism, right? right. For, for a lot of Muslims for these sorts of, uh, you know, dealing with this kind of unrelenting um, barrage of Islamophobia. I, I did want to say, um, you, you at one point highlight that, you know, he sort of participated in these, um, you know, testifying against his former colleagues, and you used the expression in order to cause harm. And of course, what's really fascinating about both Sue and Stephen Packer is they are the most well-intentioned people, right? I mean, they, there's no question in their minds that they're doing it for the right reasons. And they've literally kind of transformed um, uh, life for millions of Muslims in Britain and possibly around the world on some on some scale. Because when something like this is, when a, when a trend is set or a norm is established by a country as influential, as powerful, as militarily important, as uh, politically and economically important as Britain, that model will be followed elsewhere. And we saw in Austria what happened and we're witnessing, um, you know, continuing to witness in France and these places. So the, the perniciousness of, um, you know, these kinds of policy transformations um, 
you know, someone like Michael Gove, I don't think had the best of intentions. He's he's driven by an agenda, but the facilitation of someone like Michael Gove's agenda by these people who might think, oh well, we weren't thinking about terrorism, but. There are moments in that sort of um, episode five where Sue Packer is basically saying, well, you know, we didn't think it was really about terrorism, but a certain way of thinking can lead to places, right? I mean, there's so much ambiguity in the language which lends itself to this kind of result. Um, and, and I don't think they, you know, by, by using that sort of ambiguity, which both Brian uh, and Hamza draw out so beautifully in that sort of short episode, uh, we're able to see how, you know, they're so unselfconscious about the damage that they've done, right. um, but it, but it's so sort of normal for people to do that sort of damage on a scale which is unimaginable. Yeah. Well, I think it's a bit more than that, right? Yeah. They, you know, and this is something that the novel makes makes clear. If we're going to take the novel as a, a, a kind of an allegorical narrative for what happened. Mm -hmm. in Trojan Horse, that they valorize themselves, right? Right from the very beginning, um, yes. Croker, who yeah. ostensibly yeah. seems to be this this character of Stephen Packer, yeah. um, he's, a, he, he's a, a cockerel, right. um, and, you know, um, you know, he's part of this group of hens who, right. you know, have a, have a particular belief system in this, in, on this farm called Daybreak Farm, if we right. just kind of get into how, like, they set, they set things up a little bit. Right. Um, but yeah, absolutely. That the the whole thing is is set around this hero figure, and you know, they, they it's presented as uh, an animal farm type. So right. you know, if, if right. those of you who George are aware, Orwell. like George Orwell's novel, where he kind of criticizes how like kind of socialist totalitarian regimes can emerge, right. you know, through using a farm as a, a, a as a medium to get that right. across. Right. Um, and so he's trying to do something similar here by depicting different groups of, of, of people in different ways. Right. So while of course he's not openly stating which group is which, right. you can pretty quickly figure out that Europeans generally yeah. are poultry. Uh, poultry. Yeah. Um, you know, even those who who are not from the farm, who are brought into the farm, are kind of almost described as like these kind of economic migrants, you know, people who are coming right. to, 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 to work. Yeah. Whereas there, are, uh, there is a whole group of other animals, those who yeah. have kind of cloven feet, yeah. right? And these are ostensibly the Muslims who yeah. arrive because they've, they've suffered the ravages of, you know, kind of poor farmhand, despotic farmhands um, right. on other farms right. and are right. looking for a new new life elsewhere. And so they're asylum seekers, effectively. Right. And so you see how he sets up, you know, like why these different groups are there in the first place. Um, uh, it's it's you know it's very very reductive in its in its approach. But it, th there's also this the strangeness about it, and, I, and a number of people picked up on this. Uh, right. In, uh, in in the discussions as I was uh, as I was tweeting out that in order to to, to maintain a certain sense of demonization for mm. the bad guys in this story, so the bad guys in the story are the goats, right, 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 right. Um, male Muslims specifically, right. right. You know, and goats right. are you know they they like to to kind of butt heads with one another. They have beards, um, you know, if we were to kind of like just, just try and imagine a little bit why goats were chosen as a particularly a particular literary device mm. um, in the in the in the place of a Muslim. Mm. And you know And and uh, Muslim we, women as well, right? I mean sorry right, uh, if I'm interrupting. So No, but that's exactly what I was gonna say that Muslim women are sheep. Yeah. yeah. In this situation. But they're not from the same uh, species. Uh, the only thing that they share is, is cloven feet. Now the hen, right. he's a cockerel, right. and his his wife is a hen. So right. you know, fe males and females somehow they can belong to the same species. But right, right. you know, it, it wouldn't have worked as well for him. Yeah, I think uh, if the females had been goats, or if the men had been sheep as well, because sheep right. are are generally right. speaking within literature they, they're considered mild, right? Yes. Like 
kind of yes. think of like so many different <laughs> stories mm -hmm. and parables and tales right, right, over right. the over the centuries right and, yeah, and across yeah. both the east and the west you know even kind of a lot of islamic literature you know sheep and lamb are considered to be you know creatures that need to be cared for you know right. we, we talk about right. the prophets being shepherds right. uh for, right. for 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 you know kind of these types of animals yeah um, and so there's kind of like a, a, um, a pathologizing through these animals of, of Muslim lives, right? Muslim women are weak, they, they're meek, they're timid. But for some reason, he's using two different kind of species of animals in order to do that depiction. But he doesn't do that for others. Like Malin, so, if, sorry. If I could also add in here, um, and I'm, I'm just sort of um, reminded of a statement of Supaka. It's really striking. It, it was such a shocking statement when I heard oh. it. And she says it quite nonchalantly, and then she catches herself. She's asked by Brian uh, Reed in the uh, interview, um, you know, all of this, because she saw herself as really standing up for Muslim women in particular, and, you know, um, defending their human rights and their equality and so on. And Brian Reed asks her, well, you know, when you took the stand in this way, why is it that none of these people came to your support, came to your aid? You know, why were they all, why did they all fall silent? And what's her explanation for that? She could say, well, actually, maybe they didn't see things the way I saw it. Instead, she's like, they can't speak for themselves. They have to be right. spoken for. That's and then she point. catches herself and she says, well, not all of them, but a lot of them feel afraid to speak out. Right. And, right. you know, that in, you know, this is the a deep misogyny, Islamophobic misogyny. Um, that she's, uh, you know, in, in my estimation, I mean, this is obviously a, a value judgment. I'm not sort of like making an objective statement in, in quite the same way, but I'm hopefully providing evidence um, in case she's watching and would like, like to litigate. But in my estimation, you know, this is uh, an exemplifying of, you know, a, a way of kind of uh, looking down at Muslim women. And what's really uh, great about Hamza and uh, Brian is they br they communicate with these women and so sort of their voices are, are actually heard in this. Uh, and in some cases, they've never been heard before. And so they're like saying, well, we, we can perfectly well speak for themselves and, and they speak for themselves very eloquently. I mean, I was really taken by the, the forcefulness of the email that was written in response to, I forget her name now, Amina, I think. Uh, Amina, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, written in response to Sue's claim, uh, one of the central claims that she took and, in a sense, used against um, the Parkview, uh, you know, uh, staff. Uh, you know, that is her misogyny against, uh, you know, uh, Muslim women and their meekness, so to speak, being used to portray on, in psychology, project on others misogyny towards Muslim women. And just the, I mean, in, it, it's such a sort of horrifying state of affairs in my estimation. Sorry, I, I kind of went off on one there. No, no, that's yeah. exactly, I agree with that entirely. Um, you know, it's, it's reproducing the old uh, colonial trope of you know, instead of white women, white men saving brown women from uh, brown men, it's mm. now white women saving mm. brown women from uh, brown men. Right. Okay. Um, and, you know, we, we've seen that replicated so many times across the um, the course of the global war on terror. Uh, mm. Sahar Ghamkor, um, who's an academic in Australia, she's written a brilliant book called The Political Psychology of the Veil, where she really mm. deconstructs um, where a lot of these ideas come from and how they, um, they are uh, are applied and you know put upon Muslim, especially Muslim women. How Muslim yeah. women are often instrumentalized right. in this kind of uh, narrative of Islamophobia. Um, right. You know, of course, none of this um, ignores the fact that there are uh, there are issues of course. Um, within our community that need Absolutely. to be uh, tackled. But it's the yeah. it's it's the narrator here, and it's the way in which uh, you know kind of these issues are used in different ways in order to achieve certain ends. Right. And the problem right. with that is that when when those ends end up uh, harming the entire community, right. then this idea that somehow you're, you're whistleblowers who are going against the tide, that somehow you are these valorous individuals who, right. who really like really stood up for yourselves kind of starts to fall by the wayside because the people who are um, not necessarily completely without power, but who have every reason to be afraid 
are those who are subject of the state's gaze. Right. right. You know, they were able to very, very quickly align themselves with the state through the Humanist Association, right. um, uh, making uh, uh, interventions with directly with, uh, within the corridors of power. Right. Um, right. They were taken on on speaking tours or media tours and. They were involved in fundraising for the for the humanists and all of these things are taking place right mm, mm. because they have a layer of protection right uh, to be able to do that now those mm. who are the subject of their criticisms they're now being investigated by the form one of the the former counter-terrorism of uh, chiefs of the uk mm. they now have been spoken about by the media in 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 very very harmful ways mm. so when we talk about the hegemony of of certain narratives, the people that they were criticizing, you know, had far less power in the situation than they did, right. because you know they weren't they weren't the subject of a a full spectrum media political uh, and policy assault right. uh, on them and their loved ones. So, so in that yeah. connection, actually, I thought I mean it. So, I mean, you mentioned the British humanists towards the beginning. I think um, I might have noted down, um, you, you described them as remarkably dogmatic in an ironic sense, right? And, um, you know, I, I must confess, like, uh, I've had um, the dialogue officer of the British humanists is a personal friend, um, Jeremy Rodell, and I've actually interviewed him on this channel. So if anyone's interested, you can find the interview on the channel. Uh, and um, I actually, you know, reached out to him um, after... Uh, the Trojan horse affair uh, thing, I sent him, uh, I think I sent him the link to the podcast. And I said, you know, please do have a listen, I'd love to discuss this with you. I think this is a fantastic opportunity. Um, and uh, he uh, politely declined. Um, and, uh, you know, he basically uh, was saying that, uh, oh, I've heard that it's a bit, uh, it, it it's done a number on us. Or I mean, he didn't use that language exactly. Um, but um, I you know, politely um, sort of uh, put to him again that, you know, this is actually a great opportunity. I think this is a, a great learning opportunity in some respects, because what you may perceive yourselves as experiencing at this point in time is actually what Muslims experience as a matter of course and have done for decades at this point. Um, the the notion that, oh, I'm being misrepresented, you know, this, is, this isn't what I meant, this isn't what I said. You know, I mean, it's wonderful in the actual podcast when uh, this instance where the door is slammed in Brian's face and he's like, okay, well, you know, this is a new experience. And, and Hamza turns around to him and say, welcome to the club, man. This is what we've been facing our entire lives. And, you know, those are, those are great. I mean, um, you know, Brian's really uh, wonderfully introspective about it. He's saying, you know, I can, I respect the mirror that you're holding up to me. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm so oblivious to my privilege. And so oblivious to the massive harm I can do as a consequence of that, in the cases of Susan and Stephen Packer. Um, but, uh, you know, this is something which, um, you know, it's, it's uh, someone's commenting they can't hear me. If, if other people can't hear me, incidentally, please do um, sort of uh, let, let us know. But one person's commented, we can't hear me. Um, I just wanted to say, um, uh, Asimpe, if you're OK, we'll also maybe take some comments and questions periodically. Yeah, sure, of course. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to... Uh, pertinent to what you've just said, and I, I look forward to bringing um, Sahar um, on the on the channel at some point in the near future because I've really been fascinated by her book. Um, but um, you know, also pertinent in this context is Lila Bulogh um, sort of uh, puts this perfectly in her book. Um, uh, I forget the title now. Do Muslim women need saving? You know, what a pertinent title. Um, is it about women's empowerment or feeling smugly superior to a supposed inferior culture? Supposedly inferior culture. Um, and and I think that that's that's the unfortunate reality. A lot of this is actually it needs to skier to nafs, right? I mean, <laughs> that's that's what it really requires. May Allah protect us. Let me sort of give you the floor again. And I mean, please feel free to comment on what I've just said, but also please feel free to take it in the direction of the book more. Uh, you know. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think um, what's, what's so fascinating is um, right, really from the very prologue, um, you see discourses of the wider world being being brought in directly and one, one of one of the discourses that that is so important for us to reflect on is this idea that islamophobia is, is used by muslims as a weapon in order to dis, to detract from any criticism of islam itself 
as uh, as a doctrine as an ideology as a way of being as a practice as whatever you want to call it right like there's so many tropes about how muslims practice their faith right just right. apply yeah. whatever like you know we wield it almost like a like a sword because that's the thing that has most power right, right. like bec- yeah. because everyone is so super tolerant in the society yeah. it's not a like an ethno-nationalist kind of proto-fascistic state by any stretch of the imagination right um you know that somehow because in this uber tolerant society where everybody loves people of color uh if 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 you say anything against muslims that is somehow right you 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 will be victimized you will be um somebody who will become a pariah in, right. in the public eye right. Right. um i mean aside from the fact that that notion is laughable considering the last 20 years of intense vilification of but something Muslim. about human psychology for those who have privilege and power really masks this so dramatically doesn't it i mean like right. i i you know i i fear to say this but you know i i worry that some people would see your straight face and, and your deadpan humor in this particular instance the irony the the sort of like acerbic irony with which you expressed the last minute or two and not catch it until I pointed it out at this point in time, right? <laughs> yeah, because... Sorry, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, I was being very ironic. <laughs> yeah, very ironic. I mean, I, I was barely containing my laughter. I mean, a tragicomic sensibility again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, I mean, absolutely. I, I, I think that this is the... At, on another level, it's also the question of um, you know, people who've always enjoyed the ability to say things like "packy" and the N-word and, you know, not really even give it a second thought. I mean, the fact that teachers were addressing children with that, um, you know, I, I don't know, maybe I've had a coddled existence, but I never experienced that personally. Um, perhaps part of my secondary schooling was in, in the Muslim world as well. So, But, um, you know, that sort of, uh, you know, nonchalance with which people can tread on other people as this terrible image that I mean really painful image that's given of stepping on a beetle or an insect with no consequence um, in in the Trojan horse affair that's when that's threatened these people um, you know may feel that my world is coming down upon me and I think yeah I, I don't I wonder um, if, <laughs> if you think there's any way of rectifying that or uh, what what you think I mean, I, yeah, I understand what you're saying about the, yeah. you know, this anxiety that 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 they have. But you know, I think it's on them to question where that anxiety stems from. Mm. Like, if you if you're not capable of seeing, um, you know, the people around you as anything other than outsiders, then right. you know, you know, uh, to quote my, my my children, that's a you problem. <laughs> you know, that's not <laughs> you know, right. that's not something that. Um, you know, we can help them with like we can't we can't educate them how to see other people as human beings and right. as equal to them. Right. right. right That's right, right. it's it, it's it's work that really is a little bit, of, uh, you know, unnecessary right. um, Interesting. because, you know, ultimately, like, why should we for a start? And, you know, the whole notion of that is ridiculous yeah. um, to begin with, um, but also because, you know, I think that because they have this self-perception of their own tolerance they're never capable of ever really getting there right like we are this kind of like you know ridiculously tol- tolerant society and like right. we, you know we want we want best for everyone and everything and you know, even like just for again from the prologue i, I have to read this because it's just sure please please it's so i mean bizarre, it's, it's just know? a it's a shocking piece of writing right so yeah please. i mean he, he, <laughs> you know uh, croker who's the narrator who right. you know again right. Um, one 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 might imagine this is, is page one like isn't it yeah is it basically page... i think page two something like okay, that page right? two. he said it was it was because we wanted as a society to be tolerant and right. open-minded that right. we allow the intolerant dogmatic and fanatical to flourish right. he worried that his intentions might have been misinterpreted that by speaking out he would be considered as intolerant bigoted xenophobic but they were never the catalyst for his actions he was one of the most tolerant animals that ever existed <laughs> right, right. I mean, I assume I mean, when he wrote this, he, he wasn't uh, thinking that, you know, it would become widely known that he's actually writing about himself here. I mean, maybe it's I mean, I, I mean, I, I just don't know why he would he would he would say to Hamza and Brian that this is, you know, kind of my retelling 
of of what took place. You know, it's it's a startling admission to admission, make. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and the fact that it's it's not available um, on Amazon anymore, I think probably speaks to the fact that maybe he was hoping that people wouldn't read it because there is so much of this kind of content. But even this whole thing, of, like he was the most tolerant so, man that yeah. ever existed, right? It kind of echoes um, what Sue Parker says when she says, um, right. you yeah. know... Some of my best, my not, best friend yeah. is a Muslim my girl. My best friend is a Muslim. <laughs> Muslim girl, not a Muslim woman. I mean, I found that sort of demeaning as well. Like, presumably well, it's someone who's, who is a woman, right? Not a child. I mean, potentially it is a child. We don't know, right? Like, we we just don't know how this person. It's not operates. a meaningful friendship. It wouldn't do her, you know, very very well for, as a defense. So to speak. I mean, it's it's it, you know, just the way that the, the 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 language is used about themselves. Like, it's like you know, the lady doth protest too much. I'm I'm the most right. I'm the most tolerant person you'll ever find right, right. in history. Like, yeah, no, which, really, which U.S. president yeah. said this? Yeah, <laughs> right. So, yeah, it's just. It, it, and it's littered with this kind of stuff. And even then, as it goes into like his his background and the genesis of his own thinking, it's like, right. well, he was the most inquisitive cockerel right. on, on the entire farm. He was thinking about things in ways that nobody else was. Everybody else right. was, right. Right. Um, uh, what's the word that he keeps on using? Doctrine, right? Yeah, everyone's like, it's a very, very, about doctrine. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's a very, very bizarre word to use because it's like, it's not, exactly kind of fits neatly within a story about animals who are thinking about doctrine and doctrine and doctrine all the time right, right. but you know um the the farm's worship of this deity gallus right. um and you know initially i thought well, maybe this is kind of like a a a substitute for the word allah because it's got an a double l uh, in it right right but you know it come it, it becomes fairly uh, clear quite quickly that allah is magnus um, yeah yeah, that yeah. Gallus is akin to a Christian god. Right, right. Um, and that that religion that worships Gallus is kind of akin to like a Ju Judeo-Christian kind of like right. way of being. Um, and so Again, that's why the poultry, who are yeah. Europeans, follow yeah. follow Gallus and, and his doctrine. Although, I mean, I, I might be reading too much into it. When I read Gallus, I was thinking, wait, could this be this galls us or something like this right i mean i don't know i mean so Maybe. um but uh, but yes and and then the muslims um who are the sheep and the goats um the cloven people um right. you know and and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that cloven element i mean um i don't know if this is a an opportune moment to think about um the term that he coins and rails against for much of the book <laughs> so to speak yeah, no, by all means. Uh, you're sure. talking about clovenophobia? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Clovenophobia. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So the Muslims uh, are allegedly constantly, you know, when when they're sort of, when they're not being able to get their way, uh, the sheep and the goats in particular, so the goats are the ones who are doing this, the sheep are very sort of mild-mannered and don't really do very much talking, uh, as mm -hmm. one would expect. Um, the goats are constantly uh, start to complain about clovenophobia and constantly sort of use that as a battering ram, pardon the pun. Um, and so, and he rails against this as well. Um, so, I mean, it, it's really, I, I'm going to reread those sections just to get an idea of his notion of what, uh, you know, complete denial of this notion of Islamophobia, saying that, you know, this is just something which is made up to prevent us from having reasonable conversation, which is exactly what you hear on the right, right? It's actually, I would say on the right, but it's pretty mainstream in British society, at least. It's not very, it, it's pretty much central, and sometimes it's on the left as well, in, in my estimation. So, yeah, I, I wonder what you made of that, the, the term clovenophobia. And I, I promise uh, the sort of commenters, we will have a look at some of your questions, inshallah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it seems a straight substitute for Islamophobia, yeah, and yeah. The, the 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 way that it's in, you know it's used by Stephen Packer is to to highlight this kind of um, defense mechanism right. that you know that this community of of cloven footed or you know kind of animals have, hmm. which is to whenever they're criticized that, that's clovenophobia you know you can't you can't you can't say that you can't do that you can't you can't stop us you know where this you know you're this tolerant society is supposed to be about equality 
And therefore, right. if, you're, if you intrude on us, yeah. then that's clovenophobia. Right. And, and, and what's so interesting about that is Sue Packer and Stephen Packer, what they what what they're trying to say is that we were trying to stop harm from taking place. Right. Right. Now, generally, in in safeguarding terms, harm is something that can 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 usually be measured. The number of lesions on the body, hmm. um, you know, kind of signs of uh, sexual assault uh, when uh, the character of somebody fundamentally changes. Um, they become withdrawn or whatever else, or they, they, they um, are having panic attacks or various right, things. Right, there, are, right. there are ways of empirically measuring uh, harm within a, within a safeguarding world. And I mean, even safeguarding itself, it can be becoming problematic as a, as a construct, but let's just go with that for now. Okay. So how are they assessing harm? And what Stephen Packer through, through Co Croker and through Scarlett, who's, you know, you know, we could say is potentially a, a substitute for, for Sue, maybe. No, it's very much, very explicitly so, I think. I mean, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and and it, they sort of like write, um, a, you know, the, the epilogue or the, the afterword together, actually, Susan. So, I mean, that's why I think it makes a lot of sense for them to be seen as the couple, even though they're not right. married in this. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, you know, and so they... Um, what are what are the issues that they're taking with? It's not just um, harm that's taking place that can be measured. It's more about the way in which um, what um, the younger kind of goats and sheep are being taught to believe. Right? right. That's kind of one of the central contentions. And there's this whole really really kind of bizarre passage that effectively describes Muslim, Muslim kind of eschatology about the final days, right, right about Yawm al-Qiyamah. Right. Um, and it's almost verbatim, right, about like the concepts of, of, of paradise and hellfire. And, and, but the way that it's presented is like, well, if you believe in this stuff, hmm. then you're basically batshit crazy. And right. you are causing harm to the people. Sorry for my, my, my language there. Like right. you're basically you're basically causing harm to uh, to those who are learning this stuff. Now, right. either you know they're going to have to accept that 1.8 billion Muslims around the world, oh, for the for the vast majority, yeah. you know, believe in this stuff, and therefore yeah. we all require some kind of intervention, which maybe they do believe, right? Right. Or, right. Um, you know. They um, they're wrong about this, and and that's the thing, right? It's what they're highlighting as being problematic is largely based on the belief itself, right? right. On right. on the fundamental ideas that they have, and they eventually go into talking about, well, you know, nobody should be teaching their their children this kind of stuff without teaching them, you know, all these other ideas and doctrines and whatever, and, and being right. critical, right. almost like. Um, Muslims have to, even in their own personal lives, even in the, right. in the sanctity of their own homes, right. they have to do this like liberal exercise right. of teaching stuff that they don't believe in themselves, right? right. As rational kind right. of, you know, moral human beings right. um, to their children, because, you know, somehow uh, in order to be good people, yeah. we have to teach our kids to think like atheists, right? right? right. And that's the central conundrum of, yeah. Yeah. of, of uh or the central problem with uh packer's work i mean it wants, a, yeah, yeah sorry, it, it wants to extol atheism yeah. as a as an ultimate virtue yeah okay and so you can't get around the accusation of clovenophobia because <laughs> <laughs> because um his 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 disdain is not for harm his disdain mm. is for the religion itself and its mm. and its central tent of its belief system. Right. I mean, this is the thing. In the view of people like um, Stephen and Susan Packer, um, at least is portrayed in this sort of a text, which he himself says this is kind of his telling of the story. And so I, I think this is, uh, in many respects, an unvarnished version of his viewpoints. I mean, as one of the commenters kind of somewhat amusingly put it, you know, saying the um, basically... Okay. Basically, you can say all the quiet parts out loud as long as you're a rooster of some kind. I mean, he's basically saying all the quiet parts out loud. Um, 
the the thing is for people like um uh, the packers it really seems to be the case that for them harm is equated with belief in these sorts of things and to be honest that's the viewpoint of new atheism for the last 20 20 25 years right i mean since uh, so the Sam Harris's, the uh, Richard Dawkins of the world. I mean, Richard Dawkins, of course, was, um, you know, the head of the humanists, uh, or I think uh, the honorary head of the humanists for a period. And um, he's quoted in the uh, sort of uh, his Islamophobic statements, I think, um, you know, rather glaringly Islamophobic statements were quoted uh, in the uh, episode five. Now, I mean, I, I, I just sort of wonder with with people like this who are so sort of committed to their uh you know dogmatic viewpoints it's it's very difficult it's ironically very difficult to reason with them right because what they're doing is they're basically imposing these very dogmatic perspectives dogmatic views about what it is to be decent right um you know what uh, how people should train their children or, or educate their children what um you know how people's autonomy ought to be restricted in order for them to conform to a tolerant society. Um, and uh, to be honest, this is the turn that quote unquote liberalism has taken in the wake of the war on terror uh, in the form of muscular liberalism and people saying we we cannot any longer tolerate intolerance, for example. Um, and, and that sort of language also, of course, has its echoes in classical liberalism as well in the writings of people like John Stuart Mill, who, you know, famously in uh, what I consider otherwise a brilliant essay, because um, he was a great stylist as well, on liberty says, well, civilizations in their knowledge, meaning, you know, in their infancy, and he was referring to India here, where his father was a, a colonial administrator, you know, they, they need um, mature civilizations to take care of them, right? What a beautiful justification for colonialism. Of course, lib you know, colonialism was a liberal project uh, as well. People, I think, uh, often forget those elements. Um, uh, that are embedded in that tradition. And so, uh, in a sense, this is, to a certain extent, just more of the same. We're still living in that colonial condition. And, you know, Gove uh, is someone who saw this opportunity. He's kind of made these sorts of statements for a long time. Um, you know, he's working with uh, Cameron at the time of, you know, the Trojan Horse Affair. And Cameron was saying, we need to uh, sort of... Um, teach British values, we need to have a, a more muscular form of liberalism, the Munich uh, conference famously. So I, I, I think this is all part and parcel of a, a massive problem which can only be combated by, you know, uh, great effort and initiatives like, uh, you know, uh, projects like the Trojan Horse Affair podcast. You know, right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, it does, a, it does a great service, uh, yeah. for sure, uh, in many respects. Um, yeah, and and what what the what part of the problem with the way um, that Stephen Packer presents this this character of Croker and his belief system and whatever mm -hmm. right is that that Croker is so moral that he sees the problem amongst his own people right mm -hmm. so he you can see the ethno nationalism of the other poultry who are like oh well we don't want these outsiders we don't want to change our way of life and he's just right. like well I'm not I'm not like that at all. Right, right. I'm, you know, I would never, ever, ever be so immoral as to not want to allow people to come here and seek sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Of course, they should be allowed because that's right. the right moral thing to do. Right. They just should limit how they think about mm -hmm. the world right. once they do, right. which is where kind of like this, this is now getting into the, the territory of like the Iron Hersey Ali's now, right? right? Right. Who who say, well, hey, no problem with Muslims right. whatsoever. Like you can, yeah. you know, there can be as many Muslims as you like. Right. Just need to reform Islam though itself. Right. right? Like, right. I mean, the religion, you know, it's, it's not fit for purpose for living amongst, you know, kind of civilized people. Yeah. And so, you know, Muslims without the Islam that they're carrying, carrying, it's perfect. We've got no problem with that. This is the same discourse yeah. as Gove, of course, and, and right. the British establishment uh, on the right, which, of course, has been in power for over 10 years, which is that we don't have a problem with Islam. It's Islamism that's the problem. So they invent a word which actually congruous with how Islam has been practiced through most of history, right? right. The obligation to pray. Suddenly, like, if you see, you know, uh, if, if you think that 
your uh, belief in Sharia, <laughs> that scary word, or your belief in Islam requires certain behaviors of you uh, and limits your freedoms, then you are an Islamist, right? Yeah. Or this term Salafist that they use, which, you know, just struck me as quite amusing because like all the usual you know, markers of Salafis uh, that Muslims might think of, like having long beards or, you know, having trousers above the ankles or women wearing niqab. Like, I don't think of that when I see Tahir Alam, for example. I don't know. Uh, well, I, I haven't spent enough time in a place like Parkview, but... Um, yeah. yeah, and I actually made a kind of comment to some people recently that, yeah. you know, from my knowledge, previous knowledge of that crowd, that school, um, the people who were involved with the school, I mean, they were they were never at the conservative end of right. like Muslim public life, right, right? right? You know, I'm not saying that they're not practicing. Of course, they're all yeah, practicing, yeah, yeah. mashallah. You know, and yeah, there are people that I I admire and, and whatever yeah. else. But like, if I was going to like place them somewhere, right, in my own in my own head, I wouldn't place them at like you know kind of the the let's let's take over all the institutions of the state and turn this into and fly the shahada flag over the the of Buckingham Palace type, right? right? <laughs> so, but, but the key is to, you know, it's insinuation and using terms that sound foreign, right? Salafist, uh, right. or even Islamist is kind of like, that's the thing. I mean, it, it's insinuation, it's insidious, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. And but also, like, you know, I think there's this whole thing, right, about like, you know, Muslims and their interaction with the world. Like, I would love every single person in the UK to become a Muslim tomorrow. You know, inshallah, sure. it happens, yeah. right? So, sure. you know, why not? Right, like, right. I, 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 I believe in this religion because I believe it as a moral force, okay, and a source of guidance and righteousness and whatever else. Why would I not want to share that with you? Right? But it's not just because that. The, idea the, that the irony, of course. Like it... Insidious, right? It's like, I'm very clear about it. I want to share this with you. Right, you right, know? right. I think it's a good thing. But but the irony, of course, is that, you know, for Muslims to be engaged in proselytism is wrong. But in the view of, I mean, if you read Croker's behavior, he's the, you know, he's he's the ultimate convert to a new belief system. You know, he, he liberates himself from Gallus and he's trying to promote this everywhere he can. Right. He would love the whole farm to all sort of abandon Gallus and then, of course, Magnus as well, uh, you know, to become atheists as as soon as they can. And indeed, you know, this is the nature of any kind of, um, you know, globalizing or universalist uh, ideology. So liberalism wants the whole world to become liberals. Um, uh, they have some difficulties there because they also still want to continue to exploit the global south. And it's difficult to sort of, you know, <laughs> ask them to become liberals, but continue to exploit them. Uh, the global south might get ideas about freedom as a consequence right. of that. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, like uh, the uh, Muslims, of course, you know, in their belief system is the idea of, you know, we want to spread the goodness, right? None of you truly believes until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. And, uh, you know, some of the ulama point out this is actually on the most fundamental level. It's your loving for all of humanity that they become Muslim, right? That's something which is quite natural for Muslims. But this is evil when Muslims want it, it's perfectly fine when liberals want it. It's perfectly fine when atheists want it, when Sam Harris wants that, or Richard Dawkins wants that. You know, this is, you know. Um, I, I wanted to uh, ask if you wanted to perhaps highlight any other, there were certain striking features of the book, but it's escaping me at this moment and we have... No, no, I mean, honestly, because, <clears throat> you know, that, that thread that I did is so long, there's just, there was so much going on. Right, and right. But I think what was what was interesting is how they are unaware in their presentation of what they're asking for. So right. Scarlett's having all these conversations now, or trying to Scarlett have Scarlett being the hen, the hen who hen, represents right, Susan, is, yeah. Yeah, who, you yeah. know, we could say is a stand-in for Susan, pa uh, yeah. Susan Packer. Yeah. Um, she is trying to talk to the, the sheep. They're, you know, slowly opening up about the fact that they don't have a voice. Right. 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 This is in her interpretation, yeah. right? Now, what what Scarlett ends up saying is that the goats need watching. Um, let, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, it was clear to Scarlett that matters could get quite difficult. The situation needs to be handled carefully, but more importantly, 
the goats needed to be watched. I mean, you know, I which page I, is this? I, if you can just quickly tell me. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't. Of the PDF, I if, if yeah, you I just uh, I'll have I'll have to find it. I just, that's fine. Um, that's fine. Okay, no, I'm working. I'm working off my own um, my, my own thread, your notes. So I, no, that's fine. Yeah, no, sorry. Fine. So, you know, it was um, it was such a moment because it's like ah right. So you know, what we need is a surveillance structure right, for these right. goats. Make yeah. sure that like. There is this full kind of um, yeah. uh, sight on what they're doing all the time. Oh, and that, the right. reason why that's important is because soon after this, we're introduced to Blister, who... Mr. Tahiran. You know, <laughs> right, right. I mean, and, and in many ways, it's kind of like Napoleon type figure from kind of uh, Animal Farm, right? He's right. the one who is able to marshal everybody. He's the right, one who has right, the right. ideas. He's the one who establishes all of the right. the, uh, the systems and the structures. But he's, he's presented from the off, from the very off, as being this, um, uh, this conniving, um, you know, individual yeah, who has these yeah. ma- kind of machinations to, yeah. to take over everything yeah, in the yeah, world. Yeah. Right. I mean, like, it, it says um, Machiavellian felt, character. Right. You know, he felt increasingly that the goats need to be organized and consequently they needed a representative or leader. He studied each of the other goats carefully, assessing their strengths and weaknesses. Right. He saw that many were too young and experienced and that in reality, there was only one natural leader among them himself. Right. Blister. Right, right, right. He considered his own strengths. He could speak well. He had earned the respect of all the goats and some of the other animals on the farm. More importantly, he felt that he was guided well by Magnus dedicated to his doctrine right? right so so he i'm um, saying all the quiet parts out loud man i mean it's just right. on another level <laughs> you know he, he, he's saying that um ultimately uh blister Bahir alam is a true believer right, right? and he right. wants to like ram this belief down the the right. the, the throats of everybody you but know, he's also I, I know, ridiculously yeah, so, ambitious right i mean right. He, he wants to he's self-aggrandizing as well in their view right. right right and so you know for for the packers there's no there's no um there's no contradiction to doing immoral things and acting in aim, uh, immoral ways in order to achieve power okay as long as you believe in doctrine Right. That's right. that's central to what's being said here. That right, actually right, right. Blister can do what he wants. The ends justify the okay, means. Okay. And can hurt people and can make people disappear off the farm and do right. X, Y, and Z right. as right. long as they get to their end goal, which is like yeah. Yeah. full full takeover, yeah. full control. Yeah. And yeah. and why this is I was I was reflecting on this and it's it was so interesting for me that when I read revisionist histories of like uh Nuruddin Zengi or mm-hmm. Uh, Salahuddin Ayyubi or any of these famous yeah. Muslim figures from the past, what these revisionists are so desperate to do is to remove Islamic uh, kind of morals and motivations from them. So they do the exact opposite in the past. So where somebody is lauded as a hero and um, and presented as being a, a moral figure, they say, well, no, actually, this person was completely Machiavellian. Right, right. like right. like religion d- didn't play didn't matter, any role yeah. in how they they because they just wanted power. They just yeah. wanted to to take control of projection, things. Projection, right? yeah. So so in the past, it's presented yeah. in a different way. But now yeah. now because kind of religion itself is seen as something that's so so insidious and right. and potentially immoral and evil. Now religion plays it needs to be magnified as right. being a driving force right. Right. for everything that that he does. And of course, you know, and I think Tahir, Tahir Alam does a really, really good job in, in the podcast and in right. other presentations that he's done over the years. Right. And, you know, f- since since that time, yeah. if only people were listening to him yeah. to, to explain what his motivations were, to explain what the situation in Birmingham was. You know, this is a man who should be, who should, you know, who in, in the words of Jonathan A.C. Brown, he should be knighted right? well, well, <laughs> in an should... ironic sense right for those of us yeah. who don't like the empire but, uh... <laughs> yeah i mean you know he's talking from america so maybe of course the full implications of course. but uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean he should be he should be praised you know right absolutely um, and 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 that's the thing i mean so this is what's really striking when i listen to episode five again today um, and again, I, you have to give credit to um, Brian Reed and Hamza Sayed for just teasing all of this out so well that, you know, very often 
when they would start to query, okay, why did you think that there was something wrong here? Mm-hmm. The Packers would get stuck. They're saying, well, you can't really, there's not something tangible or objective that, well, they didn't use the term objective, if I recall correctly. You can't sort of like, oppression isn't tangible, it's a feeling that you have. Or when Brian Reed asks, well, what's wrong with sort of the headmaster having uh, meetings with other male members of staff? Um, and they would kind of get stuck. They're like, well, when you put it like that, right? <laughs> okay. And and that's the thing. It requires this kind of like mentality of um, sort of undue suspicion. You know, as as they uh, put it in uh, in the law, you know, ha- something has to be beyond reason, uh, reasonable doubt. This is unreasonable doubt, unreasonable suspicion. It's constantly everything that these people are doing is somehow, you know, in question. Um, and so, you know, it's it's that it's a kind of mentality which really, of course, allows for, um, you know, given the circumstances, given the fact that the British humanists are, of course, jumping at the opportunity to uh, critique, uh, you know, Muslim schooling because they're against religion in schools. Um, the fact that Gove is, you know, perfectly placed and looking for the opportunity to, you know, get the get back into the limelight by saying as the um, Minister for Education, you know, this is what I'm doing, I'm, and this is why I'm so important to the country and its security right now. Um, you know, it's, it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's sort of naked ambition, right, um, wow. for people like this. I, I did want to just ask, um, so you, you've kind of described um, certain aspects of the narrative. I, there was a certain a section towards, I want to say, the last quarter of the book, which I found quite striking in the fact that it doesn't, because it's an animal farm book, and I think it's written as a form of fiction that would potentially be read by you know children as well. It doesn't have age, age restrictions. I mean, in the sense that the there's a not so veiled um, treatment of the question of, um, you know, rape, and wives being able to, you know, uh, force their sorry husbands being able to force their wives to have sex this is an allegation that is made um uh, in the uh, trojan horse affair by uh, this, the packers um that this was stated by a teacher apparently that teacher has had very significant problems afterwards apparently he had committed um sexual crimes um and so certainly you know this is in no way any kind of defense of that teacher's behavior but you know this is something which is a really course celebre for uh, Scarlet in in the novel. Uh, did you read it in that way? That, but it, it's kind of veiled as you can force, um, you know, goats can force sheep to do whatever they like. Right. Exactly. That's exactly how I read that. Yeah, um, yeah. And you know, so all of these episodes which are hinted at here right. are really sort of being played out throughout. I mean, this is a good kind of history <laughs> documentation of the history through the eyes of the Packers. And the I look forward Packers. to sitting down with um, certain people uh, from the community to try and identify who the various players are. Um, right, yeah. right, exactly. Um, you know, and that's the thing about um, that narrative in, in, in particular, hmm. that they take incidents and pathologize them with wider meaning. Right. right. So now something that might have been an isolated incident right. takes meaning for the entire community. And, you know, we've seen this with, with the entire grooming gangs um, narrative. Right. Um, it is ascribed to our not only our genetics, but our belief system as well. Right. And in fact, sometimes right. you can't separate the two. That's why when you know many people talk about how Islam and Muslims are racialized. Right. right. It's, right. it's precisely in these ways because. Right. right. A pathology sticks. Um, it it is about finding the danger in the superficial, the superficial markers of who you are. Predominantly, that exerts itself through things like the hijab or a beard or whatever it might be. But it has other ways of of doing that too. And so, if your starting point is that that one thing that I heard about from from other people, something that was you know, corrected uh, by the school, as far as we understand, um, you know, that now ha- carries meaning for everyone, that we have right. to be suspicious of every, rather than just like taking it for what it is. And it's a perpetuation of that uh, afterwards. 
that becomes particularly problematic. It's like initially she's just like, oh, right, it was dealt with, right? Right. right. But it's not dealt with because yeah. you continue to talk about it. You continue yeah. to use it adjacent to the mm-hmm. community as yeah. a as some kind of indication that somehow, well, even if it was dealt with, can we really be sure that it was dealt but with? But even, even the really language sure? that she uses yeah. is that apparently it was dealt with. I mean, she's basically saying, look, I haven't seen corroboration of this, right? Mm. So when, right. when it comes to, I mean, there's this wonderful point where Brian Reed is basically saying, so, it, uh, so why didn't you quote this incendiary stuff that you mentioned in this early letter, like apparently a, a someone claimed that you should throw, um, you know, gay people off cliffs and, and burn them or something like this. And you're saying, why didn't you quote any of this stuff in, in your testimonies when you were actually on the stand? And she said, well, you know, I only wanted to use things that I'd heard directly. And then he's like, oh, so this is hearsay, <laughs> right? And she's immediately on the defensive. But, you know, uh, she she's kind of giving credence to hearsay when it's accusing Muslims of the most heinous things. But when it comes to uh, excusing them and saying, oh, well, uh, they actually had an assembly where they clarified that, no, that's not actually what uh, it, uh, you know Islam says on these matters. Then it's like, yeah, apparently they had an assembly. Like that was the entire sort of like tone of what I got. So there's this default position of you people are suspicious. But I think it definitely it it goes wider than that, though, right? Because this is about how that type of discourse is used more more regularly. So Muslims will often be asked about their personal beliefs as a way of undermining um, their position within kind of a liberal tolerant society, and even over kind of like you know kind of cases that that have no bearing or existence. You know, like for example, uh, stoning an adulterer. Sure. Like this, this, this has no reality right. for right. any Muslim, right? Like you know, there right. are no, there are no cases that we know of in hundreds of years of our history that right. you know we have to deal with as a matter of kind of like prosecutorial misconduct. Sure. Okay, sure. but it's but kind of being asked about faith and about what Scripture says right. as a way of undermining somebody as a way of kind of like presenting somebody as um as as dangerous right. regardless of how you might understand that thing right. as being something that is um a kind of a, a moral um uh failure you know, or a flaw or, in your moral right judgment. right exactly yeah. exactly yeah. yeah and even like how kind of notions of the state's own forgiveness playing into that how right. none of this matters because they 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 understand the religion in such a narrow register that all they can do is take a single thing and then pathologize it to take a wider meaning sure. uh, a much sure. much wider meaning right. as as a sign of dangerousness right. and so that's why you know you know when they do things like this it's not without significance you know it fits within a much larger discourse of islam doesn't belong right within you know any society let alone mm-hmm. europe that islam itself as a as a system of belief is dangerous right. um but of course if that was true then the levels of violence that we see from muslims especially within the west would be at a much higher rate than they actually right. are you know so i mean i actually when when people uh, talk or insinuate those sorts of ideas um i actually um I'm heartened by it on some level, and I'll explain exactly why. Because uh, these people are genuinely afraid of the potency of Islam and its appeal to just vast numbers of people, um, and that you know makes me quite proud, <laughs> to be honest. They're so they're so sort of afraid of it that they'll conjure up these kind of um, terrifying, dreadful images to, in a sense, dissuade themselves from ever considering it. But you know, if they let that slide for a moment, they might actually be able to witness uh, the extraordinary gifts that, uh, you know, something like Islam can uh, offer even them. So, I mean, that's, you know, one of the things that um, you mentioned, uh, or possibly someone else mentioned early on was, like, maybe having, you know, reading too charitably the uh, British humanists or something like this. But, uh, you know, I... um, I really, and I commented to, to you on this on uh, sort of a, uh, on social media as well, that um, 
in the last episode, I really liked the doctor, Ahmed DeCosta, the dentist, because he had just such a pure, you know, heart, mashallah, hafizahullah. Um, and even though he obviously was really suffering himself, like he, he was living a martyr's life in a sense by living by himself, trying to seek justice for a third person, right? I mean, not even for himself. Um, but he, it took him a while to recognize actually who's actually perpetrated this, <laughs> you know, who, who's likely to have written this letter. Um, and I think, you know, there's something very beautiful about the equanimity with which Muslims confront injustice. Um, even, I mean, I, if, if you'll forgive me saying so, I see this in someone like yourself as well. You're very soft-spoken, but you're someone who deals with things which I, you know, I, I would fear ever sort of like having to confront, um, whether it's, you know, uh, particularly with Cage and, and the, the sorts of things that you do for Cage. May Allah grant you tawfiq in that. I mean, um, so, so, yeah, I mean, that's a kind of maybe a positive reading of uh, a rather dark uh, subject matter. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, I always uh, admire your um, your optimism. <laughs> I I wonder if this would be an opportune time for us to take maybe some uh, questions and comments. Um, we've had a number of them uh, over the past hour, and inshallah, I mean, they've been patient with us. So, uh, yeah. if it's all right with you, inshallah, I, I mean, some people are just saying things like "Salamu alaikum," so "Wa alaikum uh, brother Adam, um, and. Uh, some people are sort of uh, noting. I mean, this is an earlier earlier on comment. Uh, Ziryab Jamal is saying, perhaps uh, talking to me. Perhaps you place too much confidence in the humanist society. I mean, like um, you know, I know Jeremy well, and I look forward to having a chat with him. Uh, one of the things that I I didn't mention to him in the sort of voice note was, you know, it's in a sense this is a luxury that Muslims don't have because one of the things he said is that, you know. Certainly, I I wouldn't want to have a conversation now. It's too the matter is too hot, and I was just thinking. Well, I mean, Muslims get door stopped, right, or door stepped, whatever it's called. Um, you know, they they will not be able to rest from these sorts of things. But you know, this is what you can have if you're if you experience a certain type of privilege. Um, so, <coughs> um, there there's a question from someone called Yusuf Ali, and I think this may be. Um, directed towards you. Salam, can you discuss the issue of the native informant in the context of colonial slash post-colonial studies and if there is an analogue in this case? So that's a really thoughtful question, actually. I mean, I mean, you know, um, Fanon's got one of the, the most brilliant books written on this subject called Black Skin, White Masks. You know, okay. I think uh, okay. that's... The, uh, uh, but there are other... There are many, many good books. Uh, Yasser Morsi actually has a play on that. Uh, in his own book called uh, Radical Skin, Moderate Masks, which is right. kind of more explicitly about Muslims in the context of the global war on terror. For me, like, you know, I, 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 I write about this myself, but my view really comes more from uh, the Qur'an. You know, it's informed by the Qur'an more than anything else. And it really comes from, from Surah Ghafir, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents us with um, the story of uh, Qarun, or the character of Qarun. You know, what a lot of the Mufassirin agreed on is that Qarun is, and well, actually what the Qur'an explicitly states, Quran, right? is that in it's in the Qur'an. Musa. Exactly, mm-hmm. he's, from, he's from the people of Musa, right? I think it's Ibn Abbas who says that he is the paternal cousin of Musa Ali okay. Um So he's, he's from the oppressed minority, right. right? And we know that, you know, from uh, Surah Qasas, from the start of Surah Qasas, that, you know, the uh, Bani Israel, they were a minority in the society. Right. Uh, Allah talks about how if our own split society into parts and then he oppressed Bani Israel as like this, this small minority within the society. But right. Qarun is given power, he's given privilege, he's given status within the society despite the fact that he comes from an oppressed community. Right. And what's so fascinating about Qarun is that despite the fact that Fir'aun has all of these soldiers, these armies and whatever, the only other person that's mentioned by name in terms of condemnation, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is condemning all of these people to hell, Fir'aun, Haman, mm-hmm. or Qarun, right? right? Like these three people are mentioned by name because of the position that they hold in relation to the oppression that takes place. Right. Right. And for me, that's that, you know, like when I was thinking about that from the lens of native informants, from the lens of what it means to to be from an oppressed community and to place yourself in proximity to power right. that is oppressing that community, 
then this is this is like a real lesson for us as Muslims mm. that if you get too close to power and you end up in a position where you end up perpetuating and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Qarun as that he oppressed his own people right right it's in the Quran Allah itself alayhi. right yeah. so you know you know in terms of like for me personally i actually don't need anything else after that like if i want to understand what it means to be from a pre- oppressed minority and right. to then be complicit in the oppression of my own people then qarun serves an example that what lay, lies at the other end of that complicity is jahannam right, right? and allah makes that very 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 explicit in the quran allah protect us I mean, I mean, it, it's quite terrifying, actually. I mean, you're speaking obviously in in metaphysical terms, and and that's something which uh, every Muslim should and um, you know uh, reflect on, even in purely worldly sense. In in response to uh, Brother Yusuf Ali's question, um, I mean, like I was just looking at some of the clips about the Trojan Horse uh, affair around the time, and you know there were Muslim MPs in Birmingham, you know, just really taking the opportunity to th- trash on Muslims, and I was like. These people really like the worst. Um, yeah, it, it's the worst sort of behavior you can uh, expect from these sorts of circumstances, and presumably just pandering to, you know, I don't know um, who exactly. Uh, I don't know the, the context well enough. Right. Um, I mean, I mean you know, we don't make we don't make kind of individual judgments on people, um, you know, in the in, in especially in the public space. Sure. Uh, but, but I think there is a there is a typology of behavior that we have to be aware of that we have to be cognizant of when we see people making certain pronouncements about the community um that are untrue you know in uh surah qalam we're, we're taught that you know when when a piece of news comes to you verify it right. like this is a right. this is a this is such an important part of our deen right and yet when the media report on muslims all the time i like unfortunately the instinct for so many people especially those who are close to power yeah. is to just perpetuate that straight away yeah, yeah, yeah. you know they don't yeah. take any time to verify the source of that information yeah. and to 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 question whether or not this is something that's truthful and so you know i'm sorry i know i'm talking in many in metaphysical yeah. terms but yeah, you know absolutely. i i find it i find it difficult to kind of secularize my uh, no absolutely thinking. absolutely i mean i'm i'm kind of uh, you know, I, I'm saying that not because I have any desire to secularize, but because yeah. I want to maybe uh, also translate for people who are, you know, less familiar with that kind of... Right, discourse. sure. No, Jazakallah khairan. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sure. Jazakallah khairan. Um, I, I want to sort of uh, see uh, some other questions, inshallah. So, um, I mean, someone's just saying, uh, I just came to thank uh, uh, Asim, Dr. Asim, for taking uh, the hit and reading that book. Um, and as you, as you say in your wonderful thread, um, I... It's ironic calling it wonderful because it's so painful to read sometimes. Right. But uh, you know, you say you you took one for the team, and uh, I think we all really appreciate that. So, no, barakallah uh, uh, You know, somebody somebody had to do it, and I think someone I was, had to do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, you just find yourself sometimes in a moment where you're so busy with so many things, but the level of Mashallah. outrage that you have right. kind of supersedes everything else, and that's the kind of moment that I was in, right. where I was right. I, I was just so utterly outraged right. by everything right. that I was listening to podcast had really hit a very very emotional part of my right. being of that i was you know i was kind of distracted from 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 like lots of other things yeah. just to focus on this and then as soon as like i somehow managed to get hold of uh, the book itself even though right. it wasn't available um right. you know i thought okay you know what i'm, I'm just gonna have to do this for the sake of like understanding how this person is projecting his right. views on into the world right right i mean um jazakallah khair. Uh, incidentally you're saying the book isn't available i i was just going to comment that i suspect that it may have been taken out of circulation after the interview uh, you know that the uh, susan and steve pa- stephen packer experienced and they thought well this is this might not reflect well on us so let's take it out of circulation so it's not actually available to buy but um you know that there, there is there happens to be sort of like uh, certain Russian websites, which I, um, I guess I, I shouldn't sort of necessarily articulate which they are, um, but uh, they they are sort of widely used by people who would like to read books, um, and uh, yeah, I don't want to get my institution uh, in trouble, 
uh, for for sort of like promoting them. So I will say no more. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's people can people who are determined enough will be able to find the book online. Um, so uh, I, this is a, a comment, and I, I think this is just a nice comment to sort of like remind ourselves. This was about the context of women. Um, we were talking about Muslim women aren't afraid to speak uh, of speaking out. They are aware that their concerns have fallen on deaf ears for so long. They've spoken, been spoken down to, mansplaining in a sense. I mean, I think I think that's a, a good reminder actually to us as well because of course. Um, within our community, we have serious problems. I mean, speaking introspectively, not sort of obviously in any way trying to reinforce the sort of um, pernicious uh, discourse that we're talking about in in, a, um, in the case uh, of this book. But we do have problems in our community in the way in which um, you know Muslim men very often dismiss Muslim women, unfortunately, and sometimes this. You know, I, I don't understand why, um, and I f see no justification in it, but sometimes it's religious people who are doing this. Uh, you know, you notice it um, in religious people in particular. And sometimes it's the secular people who are like, oh, no, uh, we're going to take sort of, we'll give women greater space or something like this. And it, it really, there's no there's no justification for that sort of behavior, in my view, at least, um, in my understanding of Islam. Um, it, I, I think those sorts of things need to change. And inshallah, um, I hope I can exemplify that by having more sisters, um, sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, more scholars who are women as well, um, involved in these sorts of um, uh, conversations on the Trojan Horse Affair. I, I'm already in touch with um, certain uh, members of the community there, and inshallah they'll join. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything, but um, inshallah. I mean, you know, just yeah. I, as I'm going through the, the, just kind of some of my notes from the book, it's, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, um, it's this kind of replication of the entryist argument that, that is so fascinating. And also the, the idea that somehow the wider society, the institutions of state, the, the forces that regulate public life don't see Muslims for what they really are. Okay, or right. in this case, cloven footed creatures, right? Um, <laughs> you know, they're, they're not right. seeing it. And, and the reason right. why they're able to like get into all of these like farms right. is because uh, no one's seeing this at all, mm -hmm. right? They're just looking at the success right. and the success, and you know, even with the, the success of the farm. It's presented as well, you know, when the inspectors finally came, everyone got caught, so caught up in trying to present the best view of themselves right, that, right, right. that that the, the inspectors went away completely hoodwinked right. by, by what happened, rather than acknowledging the fact that a completely failing school, the worst school in the whole yeah, of yeah, Birmingham, yeah, or the worst yeah. farm in this case, in the whole of whatever, right, <laughs> right. Um, somehow started to operate in a way. And that wasn't by chance. It wasn't by and I, you know i think we have to acknowledge that you know i believe at least anyway there is a great deal of hasad um or you know jealousy right, right. involved here right, right. that this group of muslims were, were capable of doing something that these kind of like uh age old kind of white institutions were not able to do hmm. and that's and and you know, going back to a lot of the interviews of Dara al it's, it comes from one simple idea that Muslim students from Birmingham are just as capable as anyone else. Right, right. When Dara this revolutionary this, idea. This right. revolutionary idea <laughs> that you are not destined right. in some kind of class-based system right. to perform certain functions in life by virtue of the amount of melanin in your skin. Right. Right. right, right, right. Um, once you get over that idea, it's possible. It's possible that if you nurture these students, they might actually achieve something. Right. right? right. But of course, when the inspectors come in, it's all about it's they're just hooked winged completely right. um, by uh, by what's going on. And I thought that was quite interesting, especially when you when you then see his use of the word goathood. Which I right. Thought was the most... Right. Of course, the brotherhood. <laughs> That's what it right. is, right? And and that's a, that's also a callback to the Parkview Brotherhood, right? Which this WhatsApp right. group, which was cited right. in the Clark report, and and I would suggest like feeds into the the wider narrative about 
claims that somehow the Muslim Brotherhood are infiltrating institutions of state. You know, this is wider yeah. discourse that's always yeah. going on about the Ikhwan in particular, yeah. Yeah. Jamaat Islami groups or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, people like Andrew Gilligan have really um, right. promoted right. Right. this idea more so than than, than, than right. most people. He's awfully uh, silent these days on this Trojan Horse Affair <laughs> podcast well, series. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, Peter Oban's asking, asking the right questions, but, right. you know, apparently right. uh, people are hard to get hold of these days. Right. Um, but yeah, that's it. That you know, somehow these groups are conniving their way into um, all of these institutions and um, are effectively going to bring down the collapse of of Western civilization from from within. And right. and the state is so benevolent and so tolerant that it doesn't see what's happening. Right. Right. Like we like we we, we our bank accounts aren't routinely closed down. Like right. we're not kind of stopped oh at God. airports all the time that yeah, we're not yeah. pulled out of our classrooms and you know yeah. the whole panoply of right. things that muslims face on a daily basis none of that's going on right. in this world that's been constructed right the only thing that's happening in this world that's been constructed is that muslims are abusing the system in order to gain power and control i mean this this uh, reminded when you said our bank balance our banks uh, accounts aren't being closed down reminded me of a tweet i saw yesterday which I retweeted, um, uh, where basically uh, someone had at Starling Bank, so someone wrote to a customer. I'm just going to read it out because it, it illustrates something quite strikingly in a sense. Um, my response to the tweet, I'll, I'll read in a moment, but it, it says, Hi Joe, a customer is being addressed. Hi Joe, you have recently marked payments, Taliban training, jihad fee, ISIS training, Uh, While we appreciate you are probably having a joke with your friends, we are obliged to investigate such matters, which is time consuming. Be assured your friends' banks will be doing the same. This is a polite request, polite request, to ask you to cease marking payments in this manner. Thank you for your cooperation. Kind regards. I mean, no one's having their door smashed down, right? I mean, like, that's what (laughs) that's what I would expect if I did something like that. Like, this is a terrifying idea. But right. I, I basically commented saying, white privilege is when, a, when what you joke about would have the potential to deprive a person of colour of their most basic right, their citizenship. I mean, that's actually legal now, right? I mean, this could happen. It could be reported to the state and the Home Office could deprive me of my citizenship without informing me under current laws. But, you know, that's, <laughs> that's the um, sort of absurd absurdity within which we live. Um, I, I'm conscious of your time and, and uh, you know, we've just entered Maghrib, so I don't want to delay um, people as well. But I did mark uh, another five or six comments um, and questions. And perhaps we can do maybe a quick fireish round. So maybe yeah, take another sure, 10 sure. minutes or so. Yeah. So um, Afnan Dridi uh, says more particularly, I, I think there's more of a comment, more particularly arg- um, arguments underpinned by the notion of linear progress, which religion can't keep up with. Um, I can't actually recall exactly what that's connected to, but um, I, I think when we were talking about religion more generally, sorry, um, let me go to the, this is a nice uh, compliment for you, um, Spirit says, just reading the thread from uh, Dr. Asim on Twitter on Packer's work, I'm glad I didn't have to read it. <laughs> okay. yeah, so glad you didn't have to read it either. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, okay, so... Uh, this is a, another comment, I think. Um, I've always argued against faith-based schools preferring my kids to mix with different cultures and religions. But if these people are teaching our kids, I'm sorry to say, um, I'm, I'm sorry to say, I'm wrong. So, I mean, uh, this is a reflection on the part of um, the gentleman or lady, uh, the brother or the sister, that uh, you know. Uh, the thing, and this is a, a comment that is made sometimes, um, even by uh, I think. Um, you know, very committed religious people that look, it's not actually practical to send all our, all Muslim children to faith schools in the first place, right? Uh, to Muslim faith schools. So, uh, you know, in this case, the the person is saying that uh, I would prefer to send them to a, uh, to a school where they're able to mix with other people. This is, a, of course, a choice that parents can make. But they're actually being self-reflexive and saying, well, but if I'm being, if they're being taught by people like Stephen Packer and Sue Packer, you know, this is really bad for my children as well. And I think, I mean, we, we do need to be reflective. We don't have the luxury in this country to create faith schools across the board. But if we have more people like Tahir Alam, we're really blessed as a community. Um, but of course, you know, 
this is where I think the colonial condition is most uh, strikingly still present, in that as soon as Muslims are doing well by drawing on their own values and their own norms, and this is perfectly legitimate within the legal structures of our state, of our, of our country, Tahir Alam was invited to number 10 Downing Street for his achievements, right? But as soon as we do start making those sorts of achievements, there will be a section of you know, Islamophobes who will say something's wrong here. It's better that they're living according to our values and failing than living according to their values and succeeding. Right. I mean, literally, that's what they're saying. This is what right. Sue and Stephen Packer want. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, the Michael Gobes of the world want as well. Um, I, I, next next uh, thing is actually just a comment. Um, someone saying to me, Assalamu alaikum Priyo Azmi, sir, from Bangladesh, Priyo means uh, beloved, it's a very, very kind comment. Um, and thereafter, the same gentleman uh, or, or lady who commented earlier is saying, plenty of white teachers have been jailed for paedophilia. So this is a comment that we were making about the person who um, basically um, had engaged in paedophilia um, by marrying a 15-year-old. Um, I mean, I don't know if I think that would legally count as uh, paedophilia or statutory rape, but maybe maybe you're better informed on this. Certainly statutory rape um, in, in the case of uh, a minor, um, but somehow it's not seen as emblematic of white culture or Christian cultures. And and this is an important point. Um, you know, uh, when the Jimmy Savile stuff was going around, uh, Joseph, I forget his full name in The Guardian, he's a commentator, a, a black commentator, basically wrote an article saying we really need to sort out the problem of, um, you know, uh, sex crimes or paedophilia in the white community. And he wrote this kind of tongue in cheek piece. Um, and, and it's striking to read, I mean, because this is the sort of piece that is routinely written about Muslim communities. But no one will ever do that about the white community who will inevitably in this country make up, you know, the, the largest proportion, the largest number of people committing those sorts of crimes. Um, so this is, uh, again, another comment, I think. Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam. Listen to the Trojan Horse Affair, and I was truly dumbfounded, and that's saying something, because I love, I live in India. SubhanAllah. Can't help but think what a, a similar investigation in India would yield. Allah, salam alaikum. India is one of those areas which, unfortunately, I'm not very informed about, but it's really terrifying to just read what's going on periodically now. I don't know if well, you I also have think any... that yeah. in, in, with India is just that yeah. I, I don't think they require yeah. doing anything as um, you know kind of secretive as yeah. the Trojan horse turned out right, to be, right? right. right? Like yeah, because yeah. they can do it so brazenly, yes, um, with, with knowing full well that there aren't the, the same consequences for. Well, actually, so far there have been no consequences for this either. The status quo has remained the same, other than the community being extremely outraged. Right. By by what has happened, nobody has lost their jobs. Right. No apologies right. have been made. They failed nobody... Right, <laughs> yes. right. And 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 so yeah. let's not get carried away with what this moment means right now. Hmm. Ultimately, this is still yeah. Um, yeah. A, a story yeah. of of failure on yeah. the part of our community, on the part of. Yeah. Uh, anti-racism organizing on the part of um, holding uh, the public to account right. for um, and public bodies uh, to account. Yeah, public bodies to account. Yeah, we 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 are still in that failure stage, right? Until reputations have been restored, until um, that there, there has been there has to be restitution of some kind. Right, apologies to made restitution, but more so than that, there needs to be an entire systemic change in the way that our community responds to this moment that goes beyond outrage. Now, people like Dr. Osama and myself, you know, we, we see things like this regularly. I probably see a little bit more by virtue of the fact that, you know, my, my work involves people telling me about kind of egregious harms that they face every single day of their lives, right? Most Muslims don't see this on a day-by-day -day basis. And so part of the reason why people are feeling so sore about it is because a very, very clever and intelligent platform chose to take the story up yeah. Yeah. these stories are happening every single day of the week right. and because we don't see these stories we don't understand the the, the depth and the breadth of the problems right. that we are facing right. and and we have to rearrange our relationship 
with the state entirely. And I'm not speaking for Dr. Sami, I'm speaking for myself now entirely, which is this husna dhan, this benefit of the doubt that we give to the state and the institutions of the state that has to stop entirely. Right. That cannot be the norm for our continued relationship with the institutes of, of state. Mm. We have to reconfigure our role, our understanding of where we are at with these Islamophobic institutions, with these racist in institutions and say, you know, ultimately you have to change your behavior before you can earn our trust, mm. right? You are not entitled to our trust anymore. And, and this is the thing that they really prey on, this idea that they are benevolent and that they are not producers of the Islamophobia we face. They produce the Islamophobia. The Islamophobia comes from the very top. When right. our prime minister right. is capable of saying right. Right. things like, you know, uh, women in the club look like letterboxes or, right. you know, whatever I mean, that's, else. That's only recent, right? I mean, if you go read his novels, oh my God, like they're right. just horror stories with Islamophobia, right? And Gove, Gove spelt out this entire plan for Trojan horse in his book, Celsius 77. We knew about this, you know, we've been writing about his right. book for years. Right. But because the, the community hasn't decided yet in its organizing, right, in its activism, that we are fundamentally in a relationship that is completely, completely, uh, you know, kind of abnormal, we haven't taken the steps that are needed in order to then counteract that, you know. And so, you know, I would say that, you know, we live in a two-tier uh, two system, right. uh, entirely, yeah. Yeah. entirely. There is, the, and until there is a public acknowledgement from all of our institutions, that all of the major Muslim organizations, right, it's not just about Mend, Cage, or Prevent Watch and these organizations, we, we are small organizations that have very, very specific focuses. This has to come from our masajid, it has to come from our major Muslim uh, uh, organizations, which is that we need to restructure the function of the relationships that we have with the state. Until that happens, we're not going to make any kind of uh, progress. I mean, if I may briefly reflect uh, on what you've just said, and as you say, like, uh, you're, you're reflecting on, on your own perspective on these sorts of things, and I, I share a lot of what you've just said, um, I, uh, you know, as we've discussed in the past, I also sometimes think about, um, you know, the the long game. What does that look like in the sense that, you know, why has this nothing's changed? This is crucially important to highlight, as you said, nothing's changed. Someone's put out a, a serial podcast um, series. It's probably going to win awards. It's really, you know, impressive, wonderfully produced, gripping narrative. It's going to make these journalists very famous. This doesn't mean anything's going to change on the ground. It, it doesn't at all, right? Until and unless there is a systematic effort to change things on the ground. And this is where, um, you know, one of the questions that I wanted to ask uh, us, ourselves as a community is, you know, what's, what's this managed to do that we haven't been able to do with our clamoring for the last 20 years um, about the war on terror? that has basically subjected us to, I mean, we, in a sense, the the way the British community has been dealt with is a thin, end of, a thin end of the wedge. You've witnessed and you've read sort of documentation, of course, in your researches around the world at the implications of the war on terror. Um, and people like Daryl Lee, who I've interviewed on this channel, you can sort of watch that. It's a really telling, he's got a very telling book about all of this. And we only really know the tip of the iceberg of the sorts of trauma that has been visited on, visited on Muslims around the world. But um, I, I actually think that one of the things that we can learn from this is that we need to diversify our talents as well. Like the fact that one of our brothers left medicine and decided to become a journalist. Uh, let me just give a personal funny anecdote, perhaps. Uh, I'm another brother who left medicine to become a scholar in Islamic studies. Right. OK. I mean, this is I, I left a month before my course was due to start. So I didn't actually I did shadowing as an A-level student and stuff. And I did I did A-level subjects to become a doctor. But I left medicine to um, sort of, uh, you know, I, I think that we as a community have prioritized these sorts of subjects, which are kind of very typical of immigrant communities. They want to go into the sciences. They they don't think strategically about what will benefit a 
thoroughly deprived community in more than just purely monetary value. We need people who are journalists. We need people who are storytellers. We need screenwriters. We need people who are going to convert something like this into, you know, a a series on Radio Four or a series on you know Netflix for want of a better outlet.、Um, and you know, in addition to that, we need the people who are going to be the, you know,、uh, combating Celsius Seven Seven and all of this tripe and dross Islamophobic literature that is constantly being fed out. To, and as、uh, Hamza Sayed puts it in. Is hello, sorry, are you there? I'm here. Oh, sorry, sorry, my、um, my screen suddenly went. Thank goodness.、Uh, alhamdulillah. So、um, you know we need、um, sort of.、Uh, Hamza say it says at one point that all of this he's complaining to the humanist、um, guy who basically one of the orchestrators of the situation,、um, and he's saying this stuff doesn't happen overnight. This is A drip, slow build up to、um, an entire Islamophobic social imaginary, to use a bit of an academic term. Like our entire society sees the world through these Islamophobic、um, sort of eyeglasses. We're all seen as potential threats. You and I, as Muslims, are under the guise of you know under the gaze of prevent, right? I mean, I sometimes joke to my students and say, yeah, technically. In prevent terms, you could also report me, and that's probably more likely in my class than the, than the reverse, right? So, so I mean,、um, yeah, I mean,、uh, I think we really need to rethink as a community. What do we need to prioritize?、Um, you know, where do we need to invest our talents? Do we need more sort of? Do our most talented people need to become doctors and engineers and you know dentists、uh, over and over again?、Um, yeah, I, I mean. I, Maybe I, I've I've been saying to myself I need to go on the road and sort of ha- have these community sort of meetups where I'm trying to encourage people go and study the humanities go and study、uh, sort of things which will help you understand society and then think about how you can change it. But、uh, rant over, inshallah. Jazakum Allah Khairan, Doctor Asim. I want to give you the last word. So just if you want to, you know, if you have any closing reflection, I, you gave a beautiful sort of closing reflection earlier. But I wanted to give you the last word, inshallah. No, exactly. I mean, that that's it, really. I think we just need to、uh, organize in in ways that are, are very different. Obviously, we have a number of different Muslim institutions that are、right. that are working on these issues. Right, right. Right. But I think we need to hold、uh, other institutions to account、right. for not taking brave enough stances、right. in relation、right. to those people who perpetuate Islamophobia at the very highest levels. Right. Dialogue with these people. Yes, it needs to happen, but it has to happen on our terms, and they need to be called out for what they have done to our community. Trojan horse does not happen without their explicit say so.、Right. And so, yeah, I think that's that's the the direction of travel for us if we if we're serious about、uh, learning from this from this moment. May Allah grant us tawfiq. Jazakallah khairan for your time and and for your and, reflections.、Uh, yeah. um, may Allah. Give us the tawfiq to live up to these、um, norms, but also、um, encourage others uh, do that. Uh, you know,、uh, perform the duty of amrul maruf and nahi anil munkar. And inshallah,、um, you know, with that,、uh, with that niya, we have success regardless of whether we succeed in the dunya. Inshallah. Jazakum、uh, alaykum again.、Uh, inshallah, for viewers who are interested, I am.、Uh, Tentatively having、uh, Brother Tahir Alam、uh, on for a one-hour interview tomorrow.、Um, it'll be around eleven in the morning, so a bit of an odd time. I hope you'll forgive that sort of timing、uh, issue. But um, inshallah, um, this will be the first of a series of、uh, interviews, including with、uh, Dr. Asim and、uh, and other scholars and other people from the community in Alam Rock and in Birmingham more generally. So、uh, you know, let's keep this conversation alive. Let's change the way that we're thinking about these sorts of questions and think individually as well. What can I do to contribute to this、uh, sort of shift that we're trying to,、um, uh, inshallah,、uh, engender within our communities and within our society as a whole, inshallah. With that, Subhanakallah, ma bihamdik, nashadu alla ilaha illa anta, nastakhruhu tuwbu ilik. Jazakum Allah khairan again,、uh, Dr. Asim Qureshi. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you before long again. Inshallah. Salam alaikum.